Welcome to this British Library online event from wherever in the world you are joining us. I'm Colleen Cosmo Murphy, your host of this event that is part of the British Library's 2022 Season of Sound. This spring, the library will host a series of talks and performances celebrating the British Library's remarkable sound archive, one of the world's great audio collections. The archive includes over six million recordings from voice and oral history to nature and environmental sounds and of course music of every conceivable origin. The season of sound includes a full live show by one of today's panelists, Will Gregory, who will perform with his Moog Ensemble in the main British Library entrance hall on Saturday the 23rd of April. I will also host a number of Classic Album Sundays events in collaboration with the British Library, each featuring live interviews and playbacks with special guests that include orchestral maneuvers in the dark, the legendary David Bowie producer Ken Scott in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, and one of the pioneers of house music, DJ producer Louis Vega. For details on these and all season of sound events, please visit the British Library website. Over the next hour, we will take an in-depth look at the pioneering work of electronic composer Wendy Carlos. Her combined intellect, work ethic, and creativity led her to great achievements, which included her own inventions, her collaborations with the late synthesizer designer Robert Moog, her indelible contributions to the scores of celebrated films, and an album that held the top position on the classical charts for three years. I also want to make special mention that Carlos is a very private person, and perhaps some of her fans may feel we should not host an event centered upon her work without her permission. The British Library did contact Carlos about this event, asking if she wanted to make a contribution, but did not receive a reply, either in support or opposition. As Carlos's music is a vital part of the development of both electronic music and the popular music of the 20th century, it is only fitting that an exploration of her work is included in the British Library Archive. Joining me in this exploration is a panel of experts. Will Gregory is best known for his work as one half of the electronic music duo Goldfrap. His scores for films, stage, and television, including the forthcoming thriller series, Chloe. And as previously mentioned, he will be performing some of Wendy Carlos's music with his Moog Ensemble for the British Library's Season of Sound. Jude Rogers is a broadcaster, documentary maker, and an arts journalist for The Observer and The Guardian, for which she authored an article on her subject, She Made Music Jump Into 3D, Wendy Carlos, The Reclusive Synth Genius. Terry Temlitz is an award-winning multimedia producer, writer, public speaker, educator, audio remixer, DJ, and owner of Kabatones Recordings, and is based in Japan. Her work combines a critical look at identity politics, including gender and sexuality, with an ongoing analysis of the socioeconomics of commercial media production. Adrian Utley is best known as a member of the band Portishead, has played or recorded with Jeff Beck and Marianne Faithful, and also composes scores for film and television, including collaborating with Gregory and Alison Goldfrapp on the forthcoming series, Chloe. For further information on our panelists, please click the tab at the top of the screen. So let's start with a bit of historical context to Wendy Carlos, starting with her unique childhood in which she created her own inventions out of necessity. Jude, would you take us through Carlos's early years through to her work with Vladimir Usachevsky, her mentor at the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center? Yeah, of course. So most people might think that such a pioneer had a incredibly wealthy or privileged background. But that wasn't the case at all. Um, when he was born into a working class family in Rhode Island, went to a very normal high school. Um, her parents were quite poor when she was very young. They loved music. They were both from immigrant backgrounds. Um, her mother was uh, Polish and her dad um, 
had a mixed English Portuguese background, which is where Carlos comes from. Um, they met working at a movie theatre, which is in Amanda Sewell's biography, which is a nice detail, nice background to Wendy's story. Um, a detail I love, I've also got from that biog is um, how her parents couldn't afford her a piano when she was little, but she still had lessons. Um, her father drew her a keyboard on a piece of paper so she could practice between lessons. Um, but there was this incredible um, work ethic within Wendy. Interestingly, her father um, became a kind of textile um, business owner and eventually did quite well himself. So they raised themselves out of poverty in that way. Um, but her work ethic is incredible too. Um, she built a hi-fi system for her parents um, by cutting wood and soldering wire. Um, and in her kind of, one, I haven't got the age of it directly, but it's before 14. Um, she won a science contest in school at 14 by inventing a computer. You know, this is 1953. Mm. Um, she made a tape machine for music making. She built this little basement studio in her house. Um, and she was really inspired by um, kind of early film music. Um, she was really inspired by film music um, of an electronic kind, the early electronic stuff that was coming out. Um, she loved Baby Baron, she loved Pierre Henri. Um, so there's all these inspirations coming in, but um, not privilege, which is interesting, I think. Mm. But she ended up going to Brown University and then Columbia University. So many people think that she was very privileged. Can you tell us a little bit about her work at Columbia University with the Columbia Princeton Electronic Center? I think what's most interesting about that is she worked on the RCA2 synthesizer, you know, the first real kind of electronic synthesizer, um, which involved punched paper. You know, this is where it came in. So she worked with, as you said, Vladimir Zashevsky, um, who was, you know, behind the synthesizer. So this um, concentration on technical training and engineering was very important um, alongside the artistic. So that technical training fed into Wendy too, combined with her obvious musical background, which was shared by her wider family, that passion for music. You know, quite an unusual combination of, um, not an unusual combination of interests, but you know, kind of the proficiency being so high on both sides, you know, is quite unusual. Obviously they came together to form the person we have now. And obviously her talent is what got her into those universities and, um, she, and she would work incredibly hard. She would um, do midnight shifts, um, you know, so she could work on the machines and because that's when was available. She would sleep in the day and work overnight. Um, she would do anything she could to spend time. And obviously back then you would spend a lot of time to make anything out of these machines. Mm. Yes, yeah, so the synthesizers in the 1960s were very different than the synthesizers that are produced and played today. So in order to really better understand Carlos's medium of expression, Adrian, would you give us an idea of what the early synthesizers were like and the painstaking efforts Carlos had to undertake to create a sound on them? Massive subject, obviously, and there's, you know, different areas of there's a West Coast, East Coast thing happening. And um, there was some, you know, the San Francisco Tape Center was were earlier than this. And like Usachevsky and people were using tape, like French, you know, um, Pierre Henry and people were using tape and old test oscillators that they could find that just made a sound or a filter that was used for testing in a laboratory. Um, so it seems, a, I don't know exactly the chronology, but after she left Columbia, the uh, thing with Yusuchewski, or around that same time, actually, uh, Bob Moog was building his synthesizers and they hooked up somehow. Probably you know, Jude, more than I do that. Um, but it was very, very rudimentary. So an oscillator is a, is a thing that makes a sound and it makes a various different types of shapes of sound, sawtooth, square tooth, uh, square wave, sorry, um, sine wave, etc., and they have very individual characteristics of sound. Um, so, and then you use a filter to add. I can actually play you some if you want. Um, oh yeah, that would like, be interesting. You could also look at Wendy's little description with her modulum synthesizer on YouTube, which is brilliant at showing you all the different sounds and actually very simply showing you so. 
an oscillator, it just makes a sound like that. And they have different sounds. So that's a sawtooth. That's a square. And this is a pulse, uh, a sign. So they've got very different characteristics. And then you put that through a filter. So if we take a sawtooth, and we can cut that down. You'll recognize those sounds, you know. So she was working with that, but there was no, no such thing as an envelope, which is the thing that shapes the sound. I think it was Vladimir Usachevsky that came up with the idea that, you know, say a trumpet, it, it grows, its sound would grow like this, if you want it to, or it could be very... So you needed something to give this shape to the sound. Um, so they came up with um, what's now called an envelope. Attack, decay, sustain, release. And um, they are sort of put sections of the sound, um, which was actually massively epic thing. Otherwise, it's kind of just on. Take your, take your finger off. So, and I think that very early on, when they kind of had very rudimentary equipment. And um, so it was very, very difficult um, really to make, for instance, switched on bark incredibly. Will and I talk about this loads. How, <laughs> start? How, how do you make music that is so completely musical from something that just basically just goes, you know, um, where do you, how do you start? Just you. If you're in an ensemble of eight musicians, uh, um, you know, violin, viola, cello, etc., you play together, you make music. This is what we do. We make music together. But sitting on your own, I mean, we, it's, it's easier now with the kind of technology. Most people could do this on their laptops with some mm -hmm. of the programs that come with their laptops now. But um, in those days, you had this massive synthesizer that you had to patch all the sounds with wire. So you take an oscillator, you make it go into a mixer and you take another oscillator into that mixer, you blend them together, you put them into a filter, and etc. cetera. Um, it had to be thought about a lot. And would you use a sawtooth for the string sound or would you use a square wave for the string sound? What do you prefer? The, there's all these options open to you. Um, and how do you start? this massive Brandenburg piece. Where, how do you, where's the tempo coming from? When it speeds up and slows down, how are you doing that? Yeah. Well, I happen to know that just by some nefarious way of finding things out that <laughs> used um, a click. So you can take one of the oscillators and make it just like this, just use a click. Yeah and put that onto tape and then that's your and you can change that the speed of that um which will give you your tempo if you want things to speed up and slow down so it's that's we haven't even made any music yet now we've just got a click on a piece of tape so i'm always really interested in this and i don't have the answer and i'm sure it would be hard to find out exactly how it really started. And also there's no chords either. There's nothing polyphonic. It's all monophonic, one line, which is like an orchestra, like a violin in that context. Um, so it was a massive, long, long, long journey to make this incredibly beautiful music. And then to add in uh, the taste of it, the what you what sounds you might use what notes you might even add to bark because um will knows more about this that um baroque music had ornamentation that is almost like improvisation so there's it's a very wide open thing of uh, interpretation on many levels musically mm -hmm. and tempo wise and its sonic aspect 
So, is it, I mean, I think that's, I don't know whether that explains it to some extent. Sure. I think it does. I mean, we, you're talking about, of course, Switched on Bach, Carlos's debut album released in 1968, which was a surprise hit. And it really became the best-selling classical album of its time. It also resided in the number, number one position on the classical charts for three years. It actually almost didn't even happen because Carlos originally wanted to release an album of her own compositions. But her collaborator, Rachel Elkin, convinced her to perform her own renditions of the Baroque composer to help ease people into the sound of the Moog as an instrument via music that was really familiar. Um, you were saying that Will has a good idea of perhaps how Bach was an obvious choice to, to, for this kind of Moog, do these Moog renditions. Well, I would yeah. add, I think it was quite hip at that time to have Bach because we'd had Jack Lussier playing jazz interpretations of Bach and it was kind of, it was your hipster pad kind of music. Oh, gotcha. so and know, the Swingle was, Singers, of course. And the Swingle Singers, yeah. Yeah. There was the, the Bach to Rock ad campaign that the record label was doing too. It was like a kind of thing. I, I had something to add at some point. To, to, <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I just want to say like maybe like what also made a lot of the kind of um, conceptualization of that kind of synth work possible was the fact that um, Usachevsky and, and, and also Carlos were coming from histories of um, tape music and music concrete. Mm -hmm. And so with that kind of uh, ongoing relationship to, to, to tape and layering sounds and these sorts of things, I think that would have made it much more intuitive and and maybe kind of more easy to jump into a kind of compositional strategy with a monophonic synth that um, instead of just being presented with a synth as a block item and trying to figure out how to how to <laughs> multiply it and stuff so I think like that history of music concrete and tape music was also surely um, really important yeah. even though there became a technical divide and kind of like also a school divide between those who focused on tape and uh, you could say like field recordings and manipulation of samples and things versus the development into synthesis, sound synthesis. And in a way, like Carlos herself moved away from uh, the idea of sampling. And so that when the digital samplers did come out, she kind of dismissed them as as just kind of like a, a novelty thing in, in, in some interviews. I don't know what her real formal stance was, but like but there seemed to be something that happened and that was kind of parallels uh, development and the kind of split between people who were working in tape which and entering into sample culture versus um, the kind of delve into um, synthesis, yeah, sound synthesis. Absolutely, I think that's true. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm, I might not be wrong that um, somebody will know, um, was this possibly the first time that sort of conventional music had been played on an electronic instrument? Well, I think that became quite um, an issue, didn't it? Because, um, in fact, I was listening to an interview with Glenn Gould, who was a, a very early supporter of, um, you know, Bach on synthesizers. And in fact, he he said of the Brandenburg Four that Wendy did that it was the best interpretation of Bach he'd ever heard. Mm -hmm. So it certainly got some uh, plaudits from people who were, you know, I mean, Glenn Gould was somebody who played in the studio pretty much uh, only at a certain point in his career. And I think he felt a kindred spirit with the Wendy Carlos approach, which is very much a studio-based interpretation of the music. And I think that that was a bit of a shock to the system of, you know, the conventional classical world, because obviously that was very much a live performance, a collective performance, something that you did together with other people in an ensemble. Certainly with the Brandenburg Three, that's a nine part string piece. And um, so it was, in a way, it was ideally suited, wasn't it, to, um, to, to what Wendy was doing with her monosynths, because obviously it's nine individual lines. Um, and with Bach, you know, the, the sound of the lines they're all equally important. You know, there's no um, top part, middle part, bottom part um, with, with Bach. You know, it's polyphony, which means that every part is equal and every part from the bass to the, the you know, the first violin um, interchange and speak to each other. And I think the wonderful thing about that record is and why it's so suited to this approach was that Wendy Carlos was able to give all the lines 
their own specific sound and that's where the genius really for me comes in because um, suddenly the music the composition of the music becomes even more three-dimensional than it would do in a conventional um, ensemble of strings which is in some sense homogeneous you know that it's sometimes hard to tell whether it's the viola playing or the second violin or you know it's all a bit of a conglomerate of sound and I think that when Wendy unpicks all the individual lines, suddenly you get this a deeper perspective of what is happening compositionally. Suddenly you see that the, you know, the various sounds are delineating the lines so much more clearly than you would get in a conventional performance. Um, so I think that was the, you know, the, the breakthrough excitement of th this approach to, to Bach and that piece. And the other piece that I love on that album is the um, E flat, um, uh, Prelude and Fugue, number seven, which is just, uh, again, Gould again picks this one out as being spectacular. And it's it's a bit less of a, a, a you know, a monumental um, tour de force than the Brandenburg Three, but it's just the choice of sound. You know, again, this is this, this thing where, and I think this links to Bach too, because he was spectacularly interested in organs in the, and they were like his synthesizer of the day. You know, they were, he would be tinkering around with various organ builders trying to, you know, develop the sounds of the various stops and, and what have you. And that was something that I think if, you know, Bach had got his hand on a Moog synthesizer, um, <laughs> he would have gone absolutely into orbit. You know, I think <laughs> totally, um, something that he was into the idea of technological revolution as well. Um, as 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 Wendy, so I think that there were two minds there that were kind of beautifully um, sort of superimposed, and I, and I think that that album still stands up as being just a you know given the fact that it was done presumably in a bedroom with an eight track and a a, a reverb unit and and you know just all this ingenuity, um, I think it's one of the first times you get this kind of total studio kind of vision of of music and um, I think that it, 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 so it was groundbreaking in, in so many ways. I think it was a shock as well to all the people that thought that electronic instruments weren't real instruments. Suddenly, you know, the territory that they had marked out, this is our space, you know, we don't, we don't talk to electronics. Mm -hmm. That's some weird kind of um, fake sort of synthetic um, version of music. Suddenly it was like move over, you know, this album became, like you say, number, number one uh, in the classical charts for three years and um, it still resonates, I think, to this day. Well, I would say that the cultural struggle around that moment was, had a, a very long precedent though, and that we know that, you know, starting with uh, constructivism and futurism and the sound experiments going on at the beginning of the 1900s, um, going into Leon Theremin, developing the theremin for use in a conventional orchestra and these sorts of things that, um, that that debate over what qualified as music rather than noise and these sorts of things had already been going on for a long time. And we and I think that her album did, you know, bring that into pop culture in a way. But I also know that for a lot of people, um, you know, like in my house, that album, of course, we had the album too. And, you know, but it was, you know, bought by my father who was like, he was into chamber chorale music and acoustic things and stuff. Uh, he would sing in chamber chorales and things. Um, but he, it was one of those things where like, I think a lot of people bought the album and never really listened to it as well, you know, because it was a kind of, um, it did have a kind of kitsch aesthetic to it that made it something that was um, something you just kind of pick up, you know what I mean? And I think that the, the types of people who are drawn to appreciate it are kind of, you know, if you forgive me for um, speaking for other people, kind of weirdos like us. And that would actually delve into the, uh, you know, want to find it actually interesting to think about electronic music as something that was in tension with traditional uh, cultural definitions of, of what constitutes music and stuff like that. So, but that precedent though had already been there, you know, with uh, not only the theremin, also the introduction of like the distortion pedal in country music, which became, which went on to define um, the, through its kind of abuse, define the sounds of R and B and rock. But it was actually originally like started out as a country music thing for to layer the string sounds for guitarists who were short a backup orchestra and they just wanted that to flesh out their sound and stuff. So 
there are these histories of like kind of conserv what people traditionally consider conservative musics, the theremin, Leon theremin working with orchestra, this sort of thing, and the country music, giving birth, giving rise to um, technologies that through their abuses then led to a lot of other cultural innovations. And I think maybe somehow Carlos's album is kind of at the crux of that technical innovation, but also uh, there's, a con there's definitely a conservative undercurrent too, also just simply in the selection of classical music. Well, I yes. guess also that, that, set, that kind of conservatism also is one of the reasons that it made it so wildly popular and ensured that it was number one on the top of the classical charts for three years and really popularized the sound of, of the Moog at that time so quickly as well. I uh, think but for a lot of people into experimental music, though, I would say that's also what makes it suspect mm. in, so, in certain mm -hmm. ways, culturally. Well, we'd have, you know, so, we've had course. Stockhausen, haven't we? I mean, Stockhausen was pioneering electronic music in Europe, along with Boulez um, and a lot of other people, uh, at, you know, later at Earcam. But it's... It's uh, niche, isn't it? I mean, you know, Stockhausen, yeah. in a way, goes m miles further than, than Wendy Carter. Of course, that is conservative by comparison. And I think that, you know, where Stockhausen has been, you know, none of us have ever got to it. I mean, ever since, I think he still remains, you know, the furthest out there in terms of um, electronic experimentation. Um, but I think that uh, it, it's, the, it's the kind of just hitting that, cultural moment isn't it where yeah. and I think that's what Kubrick picked up on isn't it he could, because he he saw this as a a, a kind of a, a contemporary vision of culture that he could then deploy in in his world which was possibly you know running along similar lines certainly you know after making 2001 but I, I take your point that yes I mean it is conservative isn't it I mean uh the idea that you would uh, and some of the most interesting electronic music is when it's just literally trying to make the electronic sound like itself. It's not trying to make it sound like a string. Yeah. Or a mm. I mean, I think, you know, when she went on to do like the LSI Philharmonic Orchestra project development stuff in the 80s and stuff, which was about kind of synthetically recreating, you know, the kind of typical 80s thing of uh, when record production budgets were down and bands were, you know, the big bands like Chicago went from 11 members to four and these sorts of things um, <laughs> that, you know, like the, the way that electronic music was meant to kind of fill in for a, an acoustic absence that, um, you know, her own, the LSI project was also about developing synthesis techniques that were about making an electronic uh, version, a synthetic version that was, you know, indistinguishable from the acoustic and this sort of, uh, very kind of in that sense a very uh, also tr conventional trajectory in terms of like uh, musicology a relationship between synthesis and musicology how it was kind of envisioned for her and as as that project went on i thought now jude some of these pieces she had to also extend as well the these these bach pieces i believe there's one on the album that she had to actually extend well, there's a cadence. This is something yeah. that um, Will, uh, Will himself told me in the interview I did for uh, the feature I wrote for The Guardian, actually, he kind of turned this very short cadence into a sort of improvisation. And I think that's where the, you know, the real genius of Wendy, for me anyway, comes in, you know, when you hear the, comp the composer in her. Mm. You know, she said um, that she thinks to, that she said that she thought the term switched on Bach was a reorchestration. Um, and I, that tallies obviously with what Will has been saying, but um, you know, I see it as invention, you know, kind of um, maybe it's her you know, humility um, about her kind of um, her own skills really. I wanted, I wanted to add, you know, about the conservatism, you know, my, I'm from a Welsh chapel going family. Maybe Terry, we've got a kind of similar sort of conservative family background. Roman Catholic. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Protestant, yeah, kind of per se, you know, same thing, God, apparently. <laughs> but, um, my grandma would disagree, but okay. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. I'm crossing my fingers. Um, but my um, my grandparents, um, you know, were kind of very conventional, um, you know, very stripped down Protestantism, no incest, no excitement. Um, after my grandma died, I found a copy of Switched on Bark in her collection, um, of her small collection, which was basically you know, orchestral, Mantovani, stuff like this. Um, 
I never had a chance to talk to her about it, which made me sad, but it's interesting what you're saying. Um, I do think that it's maybe in, in the UK, you know, it just seems to be this record that lost people bought partly for a novelty aspect. But I, I do think that they gave the instrument, gave the Moga sort of um, authority. It could have made it into this, here is this thing that can do this stuff. It can play this great canonical composer. And that made a, had a kind of shift effect in maybe and the public consciousness, you know, it possibly did, um, you know, because I guess electronic music in Britain before that was just seen as this stuff that makes scary sounds, you know, that's what it does. And um, now here it was doing something very inventive with you know, this canonical composer. Um, but, you know, you're moving on from that, you know, my introduction to Wendy was um, a cock of orange, as it would be for most people, and just being absolutely pinned to my seat in this film club at university watching this band film <laughs> um, <laughs> on a dodgy video copy hearing Purcell and sort of knowing the tune you know because I'd heard it before but not really knowing who it was when it was from and just being absolutely pinned to the spot you know the way that Wendy can invest this music with this sense of terror um, and atmosphere and I think that music would be invested with terror if it wasn't for you know Kubrick's imagery around it um you know, her relationship with Kubrick is very interesting anyway um and uh you know they were both very tough cookies in the sense that they, they know what they wanted to do and they didn't want to be you know um pushed from their tracks with um you know what they wanted to do um but yeah, it's interesting, you know, whether it was seen as a novelty and put in a cupboard and not, you know, I never heard my grandma play <laughs> switched on. <laughs> but um, but um, you know, then but, but from talking to other people with parents or grandparents that had it, you know, suddenly the mode became something that was recognizable and authoritative. And, you know, maybe it got seen as a little bit silly three or four years later when, you know, Emerson Lake and Palmer were on TV. I don't know, you know, I'm a little bit young to remember that, but kind of um I wonder if you give it that authority um, with this edge of, you know, still that edge of sinisterness <laughs> around the edges. I think this is a good time to segue into actually her, the, the parts that she did contribute to Stanley Kubrick's Clockwork Orange. Be before to, we move on from, from yeah, the, the uh, Bach, can I just ask one question? Because you held up the cover earlier. Yes. How many of us grew up thinking that uh, that the model on the cover of Switched On um, Bach oh, switched on Bach. Actually, Wendy. Of course. I, totally... <laughs> I think we all did. Yeah, we all did. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was very, very Bach, true. But that was pretty young. You thought it was Bach. <laughs> I was very that young. Was, yeah. <laughs> well, back to Clockwork Orange, too. Could you tell us how her relationship with Stanley Kubrick came about? Well, this is something that anyone can read on her amazing yeah. website, which she sadly has a great updated, website. Yeah, hasn't been updated in any great detail since the late two thousands. Um, but um, there's a brilliant entry there um, after Kubrick has died. Actually, um, where she talks about their relationship, um, and. Um, you know, she says, Stanley Kubrick was not an easy man to work for. He was vastly interesting, completely open about all his secrets and had a dry sense of humour. You were always stimulated working with him, but it was seldom painless. Um, but obviously, they worked together in a cock orange um, and that working relationship involved a couple of meetings, but a lot of it was done remotely with, you know, sending parcels and phone calls and um, this kind of thing. And... Um, you know, that obviously was a success, successful collaboration. Um, Wendy also did music for The Shining, which didn't, um, only a few pieces of that were used in the end. Um, most, um, obviously most famously, but best known is there was a fantastic trailer for the film where a piece of Wendy's music was used, which is still, you know, you can see it online, this original trailer. It is one of the most jolting trailers for a film ever. You know, I've seen that film a lot, but it still makes me, feel scared to watch it again or even think about it. <laughs> um, I guess that, um, you know, but I, one thing I really like about Wendy's entry about him on this website is she's very keen to stress how we very easily put people into boxes. You know, we think of Stanley Kubrick as this wild, crazy, you know, director, but she says, you know, he was, he was um, quite gentle. He loved animals. You know, if anybody's a cat lover here uh, watching the entries about Wendy's loves of pets are wonderful. Yes, <laughs> so, yeah. um, 
the amazing footage of cat, um, cat, her cats climbing on the, her synthesizers in this little clip that she did in the late 80s that was used on the BBC's Horizon documentary. Um, but um, she says, you know, he wasn't a recluse. He kind of met new people. He had phone calls with friends. And, you know, it's obvious that she's not like that as well. I should say um, the reclusive genius line in my piece was put on by the sub-editor, you know, as the <laughs> get done. Um, I think, you know, Wendy as a person is a lot more complicated than the very easy, you know, boxes we tend to put her in on, similar with Kubrick. I do wonder from reading those entries of Kubrick, if you saw a fellow soul, you know, somebody who was obsessive about detail um, and took a lot of time to make sure things were right. Um, but, um, you know, they had a good, you know, working relationship a lot of the time, um, even though, you know, if you just look at the main details, um, you know, they worked together and then it didn't happen with The Shining, whatever, but this uh, tribute is on the site is very, very fond. Mm. Um, you know, um, it's amazing just thinking of, you know, how Purcell and Beethoven were reworked in A Clockwork Orange. You know, I was completely, you know, stunned when I kind of first saw it. And, um, you know, you know, I'm profoundly unsettled, you know, and I do find a lot of Wendy's music profoundly unsettling. I know we'll come on to Sonic Seasonings. I was just listening to that this morning, driving into work in the car, you know, um, with, uh, in the middle of the countryside with the weather kind of doing strange things. I think, God, this music, it is pushing our buttons and trying mm. to not let us fall, you know, be comforted by music. It's trying to challenge us all the time. You know, Switch on Bark is trying to challenge us all the time as well, I think, even though it's a conservative project in some respects. Adrian, do you think her contributions to the scores of A Clockwork Orange and The Shining, uh, do you think the films would have had the same impact without her contributions? No, I don't, I don't think so at all. Um, I think... Um, to go back on something we were just talking about, it occurred to me that actually electronic music in popular culture has, has often been as a film soundtrack. Going back to the theremin with the day the earth stood still and then on to Forbidden Planet with the concrete kind of Louis and Bibi Barron, bringing this to the general public, if you like, I, it, would be, it would be unusual for most people to be listening to Louis or, and Bibi Barron in their house on their hi-fi. Mm. Um, so electronic music had a place in film most definitely over the year. It was the place where we most, certainly in England, uh, we would have heard the radiophonic workshop with Doctor Who and various other things. And they, it would have been like an applied version of electronic music. We wouldn't be listening to Stockhausen, but we would have been listening to Doctor to Delia Derbyshire. Yeah. Um, but it seems to me that um, a clockwork, clockwork Orange set very much in the future in this weird dystopian world uh, it made uh, with somebody who's into Beethoven, uh, this violent man who's disturbed guy who's into classical music somewhere in the future. It makes complete sense to have used an electronic realization of those pieces of music to me mm. and um, compositions around that kind of feeling. Mm. So for me it's it's completely essential and i mean like the t opening titles of the shining it completely sets this mood um this heavy vibe that mm -hmm. um, i don't know how else you would have got it really yeah, very foreboding will you're also a fan of her score for tron can you tell us why you you feel it's so special well i think that, that again you've got some um, obviously, you know, two lovers of technological um, innovation, and I think it it can't be overemphasized how um, technically, electronically sophisticated um, Wendy Carlos is um, in terms of you know being able to have this conversation, you know, with with Robert Moog and also developing this synthesizer called the Synergy. Um, and the whole idea of superimposing uh, various, um, you know, unlike a Moog, Moog, which Adrian was showing us earlier, um, you know, there's ways of superimposing various tones which go towards emulating, you know, acoustic instruments or creating totally new sounds. And I think that 
uh, Wendy Carter has been on the forefront of developing all these new ideas. And so I think that, um, you know, when they were trying to insert computer graphics into, you know, uh, whatever they're doing in Tron, I'm still not sure how they did it. Um, obviously, that would have been grist to the mill for, for Wendy Carlos, you know, something that's breaking the mold um, and developing some technology. Um, and I think that some of the sound design in it is, is really impressive. It's, it's, it's beautiful. And I remember myself being impressed going into arcades after Tron came out and some of the games that they play, you know, throwing discuses around or the motorbikes, um, uh, they had the best sound in the arcades because they, you, you go and sit, you put your head between <laughs> two speakers of the, the video game and um, you've got this amazing 3D sound, which I'm sure Wendy Carlos would have had a hand in, you know, because she understood so well, you know, how to move sound around. So I think that was important, but, but I mean, I echo this, you know, I think this beautiful relationship with, with Kubrick, I think that he was someone who was absolutely obsessed with cameras, wasn't he? And the detail of F-stops and trying to film in candlelight and all the other things that happened with Barry Lyndon and, um, you know, all the, the cameras that he would hoard. Um, I'm, I'm sure that if they, if Wendy was into cameras, they would have had, you know, hours of conversation about that kind of thing. And they probably had hours of conversation about synthesizers, because I think that uh, Kubrick obviously had this very wide ranging mind. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it just feels like this, you know, this obviously dysfunctional marriage. And but it was a marriage, no doubt, wasn't it? And I think that, um, as Adrian says, this idea of uh, reinterpreting, because obviously Clockwork Orange is set slightly in the future. And we've got this distorted version of the of these classical pieces, which perfectly mirrors, um, you, you know, the taste that you get left with uh, of something unsettling, familiar, but somehow totally unfamiliar. And I think that 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 also comes into Tron. And um, although there's a lot of orchestral, I think that Wendy got excited, she was obviously offered an orchestra. Um, so there was a lot of orchestral music in there, too. Um, and that must have been a bit of a liberation for a minute to leave the bedroom and get a, a full orchestra to play with. We, we've just touched upon it, but I want to elaborate on it a little bit further for viewers who may not be aware that she obviously had a very great relationship with Robert Moog as well as she did with Stanley Kubrick. And she also kind of helped develop uh, some of the technologies through feedback and hours and hours of conversation and letters. Jude, can you maybe mention some of the things that she suggested to Robert Moog? Well, the thing that always amazes me is that she kept on him very, very on, very early on about having a touch sensitive keyboard for the yes. Moog. And this was kind of, um, you know, 64, 65. It didn't become a feature of synthesizers until the late 70s. Um, but, uh, you know, she was, and she was quite adamant, this has to be done, this has to be made, <laughs> um, even though the technology wasn't there. So her ambition sonically was, you know, out there. You know, Terry might be somebody who could speak a little bit more to the functionality or kind of, of that, but, um, you know, that always fascinates me, that kind of, because, you know, for people who don't know how to kind of patch things together and do things, you know, I am a musician from, you know, way back, you know, play the violin, play the piano. I've never used a Moog though I desperately wanted to. And I've been to Will's studio many years ago and I wanted to fiddle with everything. <laughs> um, but I like the fact that when you wanted to have something that could be, was accessible, that people could have a relationship with, it wasn't too difficult. Um, and, you know, the fact that she has kept um, working with, you know, more accessible technologies through the years, you know, this wasn't just something that had to be used by a group of, you know, academics in a room that was not available to the people. She wanted this to be available more widely. And I think that's probably one of her most important um, contributions to, you know, music <laughs> in general, you know, that kind of um, commitment to widening its availability um, to everybody. You spoke earlier about Sonic Seasonings, which I have to say, I think is uh, my favorite album by Wendy Carlos and the first one to solely feature her own compositions. It came out in 1972. It's a double album. Each side takes up one, each composition takes up one whole side and each one is based around one of the seasons of the year. It's a mixture of electronic music experimentation and also field recordings, which I believe were recorded by her then collaborator, Rachel Elkind. And it's also kind of known 
as a proto new age, proto ambient album. Would you agree with that, Jude? Oh yeah, definitely. You know, there was, you know, we were getting to the early stages of, you know, the new age movement then and, you know, field recordings, dolphin sounds, you know, this is all starting to happen around the early seventies, that kind of interesting environment as well, tied in with, you know, some, books that were coming out and things like Silent Spring, you know, there's this idea of, you know, um, you know, the, and obviously the hippie movement and elements of hippie movement and environmentalism. Um, but um, with Wendy, you know, I think it's quite weird. I'm in an office today with a uh, picture behind me that is a bit like the cover of Sonic Seasonings. It's quite weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's Black Mountains in Wales. Um, but, um, you know, um, again, on her site, uh, Wendy talks about the development of it, you know, how it's, it's very lovely, simple idea in some respects. You know, each of the, it's full for contrasting movements, each loosely based, she says, on images of the four basic seasons on our planet, spring, mm. summer, fall, winter. Um, she talks about being how her compositions are a sense of programmatic music, so music that sets a mood and that can suggest things. Um, you know, there's a lovely line at the end of, um, that uh, this, it's from the original liner notes for Sonic Seasonings. We ask that you, the listener, supply one element that we could not possibly blend into the final mix, your own imagination mm. and, his and his remembrance of nature's blessings. I think that's interesting, bringing the listener in. Um, it's an extraordinary record. And again, it's not, you know, oh, spring, birdsong, you know, and then yeah. sunshine. There is birdsong and it, it, it talks about how nature is not this comforter nature is something that is can be quite frightening it can be quite wild it can be random it can change on a you know spin of a dime you know it's um um so it, it's ambient in the sense that it puts you in a place in a mood but it's not something you put on to you know in the background to soothe you while you're concentrate trying to concentrate on something right. you know there are records i go to for that i'm one of those people who will listen to thursday afternoon by brian eno on repeat while i'm trying to finish a piece um <laughs> This is not one of those records. You cannot not be present mm. for this record. So it's, yeah, it's it's not quiet. It's not Brian Eno's ambient where, you know, it's quiet music. It isn't. It's um, elemental music. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think it's probably my favourite of her records because it just um, creates this world. It's quite, it just creates a landscape. And it also echoes her interest in... Um, you know, the world, you know, um, you mentioned, um, somebody mentioned her interest in, you know, if she was interested in cameras, she'd have talked to Kubrick. She was interested in cameras because she used to take amazing pictures of solar eclipses, which are also documented on her website, which I would encourage anyone to check out. You know, her, her and Rachel Elkins went on these amazing trips throughout the 70s to find solar eclipses. So on top of all this sonic... I think eclipse. she went to every single uh, full solar eclipse between like 1972 to 1985 yeah. and photographed all of them. And some of them even made their way onto covers or magazines like Astronomy yeah. Magazine and oh, somewhere well, with NASA magazine. as well. Her mind, her imagination, her... Um, you know, enthusiasm for the greatness of the natural world. I think that's so, you know, inspiring is a word that is overused, but it it absolutely is, you know, it's enlivening, you know, um, and um, you sense that kind of listening to this record, there's an awe there, but it's, you know, it's an awe of the sublimity of nature, the proper sublimity, you know, the way it could be terrifying in the same way as it could be beautiful. Mm. I mean, her intellectual capacity is astounding. And we've spoken about her sense of invention, the sheer work uh, and drive to produce an album like Switched On Bach, having to make those sounds. I mean, it would take hours sometimes to, to create a single note. Uh, we've spoken about her own composition, but how about her as a sound innovator and somebody who really kind of challenged the musical forms that we work within? And I'm thinking mainly about temperament. I mean, most music, modern music that we know of and Western popular music is in 12 tone equal temperament. Um, but she was very frustrated that contemporary musicians would always stick within this kind of a framework and always kind of using the same sounds. Adrian, do you, do you have something to say about this? That's another huge subject, isn't it? And I've, yeah. I've, um, I think we all come up, up against it with, um, I think, Will, you would probably be able to talk about, um, it's, I don't know where to start. I think um, the thing that attracts me going back to Switch on Bark, actually, and 
and that is in equal temperament, supposedly. And so they're splitting voltage to be able to make an octave div divided equally so that the notes... But what really attracts me to that record and many other early electronic music in that context is that the tuning is very often not quite right. And I have heard later interpretations of Bach on synthesizers that is really, really not interesting at all uh, in that it's, it's tuning is so absolutely spot on and not, um, not to me anyway, very interesting. And I think that Wendy must have come up against the fact that Bach and every single town, I think had different tuning. If you look at Baroque organs, some of them have split keys. So there's two keys. So your C sharp would be, you had two options of how it would be within whatever scale you're playing. So apparently Mozart wrote something in F sharp major, which on a mean temperament piano sounded really bad. And he did it deliberately to make it sound, this is what my friend has told me. Mm -hmm. um, so you couldn't play in every single key perfectly. And so um, tuning became standardized at some point in order to, to make it possible to play in all keys. Um, also, it was set at A440, which is a, it's, it's gratuitous, I think. Um, and I have worked in A430 uh, four, four or four, something. What do you mean by A440, A430 for the viewers who aren't familiar with that? Yeah, actually on a Moog synthesizer, and I would add that the octaves are in feet lengths, just going on for something Will was talking about earlier, um, which is based on organ stops. But um, Bob Moog also put on his mini Moog um, this which is a tuning thing and it's tuned to 440 hertz mm -hmm. um, and it's note of A. But that is completely gratuitous. Nobody, there's no, that is just set by, I think it was set in France, but mm -hmm. it could be lower than that. And there is a whole theory about, and I have played in a lower pitch than that, where everybody tuned to a lower pitch. And to, to my feeling, it felt more, more interesting, more calm, more something. Mm. If you can read about this uh, endlessly if you want to. It's a, it's a massive mathematical subject of, about the divisions of notes. And Bach would definitely have been extremely involved in it. And, um, and I'm almost certain that Wendy would have, well, she would have been struggling with actually trying to, on a Moog synthesizer, as you go up the octaves on the switch, it gets more and more and more out of tune. So you have to retune all the time. Mm. Um, so that's one aspect of it. And I do believe, I don't know the record, is it called Beauty and the Beast? Mm -hmm. Done in um, Mean Temperament, I think, which is a different type of, more of a early Baroque type tuning. Mm. Will, did you want to add to this? Well, I mean, you know, my experience of um, tuning and synthesizers is that they go out of tune. <laughs> um which is uh, not deliberate and but it's also possibly why switched on bach has that you know sort of slightly scrunchy vibe and th yeah there's definitely bits in it where you can tell that she's recorded up to a certain point and then she's started again and carried on but maybe it was a warmer day so all the oscillators are a little bit sharper or i mean it's interesting isn't it that that synthesized purely electronic and acoustic instruments share this thing of being temperature dependent on their pitch, you know, until we get into the digital world when it all gets terribly boring and flattened out. And there is something alive about these early synths and their age. And I know we love that about them, that they're that they are wayward, that they they go off in, you know, spurious directions and um, surprise you. And the next, you know, you set up a tuning and the next time you play it, someone's opened the door and the temperature's dropped a degree and they they've gone off somewhere, you know, and um, when we do it live, uh, when we play Brandenburg three, you know, we we tune up before each piece, and after the first time we do it, the audience are like, "Oh, very, very amusing," you know, tuning up. <laughs> and uh, after we've done it about the tenth time, you know, you can see the faces getting a bit longer, 
but unless you do it, you know, they, they go off and um, like some sort of, they go overripe. Um, mm -hmm. And it's rather wonderful. And I think it's something that uh, should be celebrated and, and um, you know, up to a point. And of course, the, as Adrian says, you know, you've got the infinite then possibility because they're electronic of having this mathematical choice. You know, you could m put an octave or a whole range of a keyboard could be playing a semitone, you know, so you could have, uh, um, you know, someone like Harry Parch who develops all these kind of 32 note scales would have um, really appreciated, you know, this ability of electronic instruments to open up the whole idea of tuning and, um, you know, explore all these subdivisions of pitch, which are, as Adrian says, totally arbitrary. I mean, the 12 note scale, okay, it's based on Pythagoras, but it, um, you know, it's, it's, within our grasp now to sort of tweak it and and send it in all kinds of different directions and um so i think that 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 is something i'm sure that terry might have an opinion about as well well i i did have something but i lost it <laughs> <laughs> sorry i just ran out of school myself no. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking terry yeah. you were talking before that you felt that her you know she had a more conservative approach to to the actual well, act of composition but how about in the in the sense of scales in which she wanted to work how she would challenge other contemporary musicians to kind of get out of their comfort zone and use different temperament use different sounds yeah but like microtonal scales and these sorts of things are also very much a part of like the playground of academia and the way that i think more and 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 there was also a kind of um it, it was it was still kind of about formulations of rules in a way you know it wasn't about um for example like um if we go back to the Sonic Seasonings album, um, which for me is probably her most listenable album, I would say. But I also immediately start to identify it with other albums of the time, like for especially what was going on in Germany with the kind of more hippie meditative aspects of Krautrock, like Deuter mm -hmm. or um, these sorts of things, these sorts of producers. Although like the German, the Germans were kind of more relating it down to like folk music i would say and in carlos's case it still was very much about a kind uh, it, it it's very much more compositional mm -hmm. i would say and and that this kind of i find it interesting that this kind of in a way you could call it meditative music meditation music um despite the kind of moments of what what you might call disruption but in general it's like kind of medit meditation kind of album but it's still very much in opposition to repetition and trance. And I think that in terms of like Carlos's ongoing, it, maybe it sets the stage for her antagonism against disco and the way that synthesizer would be used later um, where like, you know, she's quoted in several places talking about how like she, you know, if you, if you said something 16 times, then I, then I understand it already and move on kind of thing, you know, like compositionally <laughs> speaking. So, but, you know, we know also that, you know, from the underground perspective that this, this idea, of course, what the repetition is actually about is not composition. It's about trance mm -hmm. and it's about a kind of, um, you know, dance culture in that sense. And I, I think that as a kind of underground producer myself and who also has worked a lot in ambient music due to its um, political resonance with the culturally minor um, in terms of like uh, around in the 70s and I think it was in 77, Jacques Attali had a book called Noise. And one of the kind of fundamental theses of the book was that um, basically the logic of um, Basically, like that, the logic of musical orders reflects the cultural orders, and that what is defined as noise and and not music uh, is more relatable to the cultural periphery and what is excluded in culture. So there was a, a kind of political undercurrent of the ambient movement, as opposed to the kind of you know more American spiritual new age blah blah. That there was this kind of you know in a way Marxist, you could even say. Um, and uh, roots to uh, a kind of socially grounded form of ambient music that was interested in this notion of noise as a kind of symbolic, um, a, 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 a symbol or metaphor, uh, con audio construct that kind of invoked a position of the culturally minor. 
And I think that in the way that Carlos approached that concept of like using special tunings in order to kind of subvert the harmonics of conventional musicology, still for me, from my perspective, still functioned in a musicological sense. It was still about a kind of um, tuning game and a kind of craftsmanship that was perhaps deployed in a way that was more about opening people's mind as to what could be music, as opposed to, for example, in my case, trying to um, open people's minds to um, the functions of noise. Or do you mean also like versus aesthetic versus intellectual kind of pursuits? So it's not not about being aesthetically pleasing, for instance. I I mean, I I, I think in a way, once you get into that kind of academic kind of microtonal composition and stuff, it's it, the concept of pleasure is really kind of arbitrary. And, I, and even in my own work, you know, pleasure is quite arbitrary and the discomfort <laughs> is part. But, but, you know, like, I mean, it's really not about making things sound nice. And I think that was all, that's also part of the point mm. is to, to get people to think about the real possibilities of sound Uh, as something that doesn't have to simply be positive in affect, you know, and Mm -hmm. that it can open up into these other tools and other uh, feelings and invoking different forms of affect that might be uncomfortable, that might be um, unusual, and that might, you know, make you question, yeah, is it noise or is it music? But I think for her, the, 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 the cultural vibe that I get without having ever spoken to her is that, is that she's more likely to say, yeah, it's music. It's all music as opposed to, to saying like, yeah, the 12 tone is also just noise, you know, like mm. uh, she's, you could go either direction like this. I don't I don't know. Maybe I'm just out. Of, maybe I'm wrong, but no, that's I, kind of the feeling I get. I think you're right. I feel I feel that I. I, I feel that, too. Yeah, I don't know if I can enlarge on that. But I'm just I'm, I'm very interested in that aspect of tuning. And. I was interested in what Morton Subotnik was doing earlier on in the San Francisco Tape Center and their kind of, they didn't even have a keyboard on their instruments. So it wasn't really ever about pitch, but there's some kind of intuitive feeling about tuning. And, and I've, in some of my most favorite music, well, Stockhausen and um, Radiophonic Workshop and David Vorhaus, the, the, I'm not even sure that everyone was aware of what you've just said. And I do know people who intellectually split an octave into 19 tones and it's harsh. I, I definitely do not want to hear that kind of music it, it, um, in, in a, you know, it's more, it's, it's very intellectual and mathematical. And there's a lot of talk about it and it's incredibly interesting. I'm not very good at math, so it doesn't <laughs> trust me that, but uh, um when you actually hear music quite often, or when I actually hear music based on those kind of things, it's, it's a little, it's a little inter- intellectual in some way. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I, it, it was kind of sparked by what you were saying, really. And the noise aspect of things, I think is more, in some way, more intuitive and more um, visceral. So we heard about how Wendy Carlos has been an innovator technologically making her own inventions, compositionally challenging other musicians to use different temperaments and different sounds. Do you feel that her work is really important to the narrative of electronic music? And what place does she hold in the wider arena of 20th century popular music? This is kind of our our wrap up. Do you want to start, Terry? Uh, no. <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think I, I, uh, I, I say no because I'm not sure like how to, I, I think for me, the, the thing that is most interesting about her work when I listen to it is the engineering aspect of it. Mm. And I, um, in a way it's like, um, and this is going to really come across as harsh, but like, you know, it's, it's like, I, I think that I think that it's it's really fair to credit her as a developer and engineer who actually composed with the devices that she worked on. Because a lot of audio engineers, um, like I have friends who work w- with uh, uh, Korg and things out here in Japan, that um, you know a lot of the developers 
do not actually produce music themselves or, or audio themselves. They, they engineer it. And this is also, and then they kind of come up with things that also, this is why the kind of, um, you know, if you ever played like a synth, um, uh, uh, what the default sample songs inside a synth and stuff, they're, they're disasters every mm. time. Like I can't think of a single synthesizer that has a really enjoyable, interesting uh, demo song on it. And um, so I think that, you know, like for Carlos to uh, have worked, have bring all this kind of compositional training that she did to the kind of engineering side is really kind of, I think what for me is the most interesting, but I think also like kind of when we think about the history of electronic music and how it has progressed so much through abuses of technology and people not knowing what they're doing and um, the idea of products being developed for one market that then fails and then falling into the hands on the used market cheaply into the people who don't know what they're doing. And then those abuses kind of became the impetus. I mean, that happened with R&B and, and rock. And it happened, of course, with uh, Acid House and the 303 and yeah, all these sorts of things. Techno. Yeah. So it's like, uh, you know, this idea of, uh, from my perspective as a producer, I think the most cultural advancements are the ones that happen by accident. And so I, that's kind of why I value her engineering side more than the kind of compositional side. But um, others may, may disagree, of course. But. Oh, I think I'm, I'm there with you as well. You know, I think that touch sensitive keyboard vision is very important. I think um, the imagination um, that she has and you know, allowed, you know, had such an effect on everything that went from there. You know, um, as we were talking earlier on about, um, you know, Clockwork Orange and The Shining, you know, so much of the atmospheres of that film are, especially Clockwork Orange, of course, um, about what she contributed to them. Um, and it's about the idea that you should keep pushing, um, pushing the limits of what a piece of technology can do. You know, the fact that she started on a machine that was the size of a room um, and you had to operate with punched paper. <laughs> and, you know, the last thing we know about her, you know, um, I interviewed Laurie Spiegel for my um, piece for The Guardian. Um, you know, I emailed and called lots of people and she was the only people that, um, that responded. I wanted the, uh, the only, um, you know, synthesized pioneer herself, you know, an electronic pioneer herself who, who did that. And she said that she, you know, all she could reveal is that she'd been working with technology companies, she'd been working with Apple, you know, and I'd be fascinated to know, of course, behind the scenes, you know, Wendy does not want us to know, and that's absolutely fine. But um, you get the sense that in that, there's that commitment to pushing things, doing things in new ways. And, um, you know, that's the spirit behind some of the best electronic music we have still, you know, it's a, maybe a bland thing to say, but I think as an innovator, you know, she set the parameters. Yeah, I, push those parameters. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that onwards, what people would have heard from Switched On Bark, like Paul McCartney and George Harrison, would have ended up buying because they had the money to buy this thing. But these modular mugs, because they were huge and really expensive, and there weren't many of them uh, to get one. I think they sent theirs back, and actually, I think that some of those early mugs went on to different people. The Rolling Stones had one. Um, you can see it in performance in the film that went on to be owned by Tangerine Dream, which who use it in a very different way and made incredible music onwards from there. But I remember listening to Abbey Road as a kid, and I didn't really know what that what this stuff stuff was within. And I still reference those sounds today. I still mm -hmm. make those sounds today. They're very simple now to do on old modular Moog stuff or mini Moogs, but they're really in my in my DNA, I think. And I think it started with Wendy using this in a more ex, um, accessible way with Switched On Bark. And a whole plethora of people would have heard those instruments, um, uh, that, that record, and wanted to do this with their instruments. And then there was obviously lots of records that jumped on the bandwagon of Moog, like the electric cow goes moo and... <laughs> which were not that, they're totally not interesting to me, other than from massive kitsch value. But the, 
the include you know the these these synthesizers, especially with the Beatles, for me, were huge. Not have done made those sounds, those atmospheres without them. And I could talk for hours about that, but. <laughs> <laughs> We can't forget also Isa Tomita doing snowflakes or dancing about three, four years after I think switched on Bach. And and also if you think about Survive, we were talking about this juice, Survive, the, the band that scored Stranger Things series. Yeah, they, big we, fans of Wendy's work. Big fans and not just in a kind of, hey guys, this is really cool. <laughs> you yeah. know, I interviewed them as well for the Guardian article and you know, they had you know, they were interested in the equipment that was used at the time, the patches that were used, you know, the nuts and bolts, um, and to kind of revive that, the spirit of that music, as well as, you know, of course, there's some nostalgia in there as well. Of course there is. But, um, you know, um, I thought it was very interesting that they said they picked up um, Wendy's records in the early 2000s, you know, every kind of secondhand record shop in the West Coast seemed to have these copies of Wendy Carlos. And this was the you know, early age of, you know, really crate digging online. Um, and also bands like Rage Ahead of Put, Rage Ahead of Put, Kid A, there was a kind of some quite big artists were kind of pushing, you know, kind of this interest in, you know, doing purely electronic things who you wouldn't have possibly expected before. Um, so it was pushing, you know, these young teenage, you know, proto hipsters <laughs> to um, <laughs> find these records and seek out these new sounds and go back. Obviously, you know, there's a fetishization Fetish, if I can say it, fetishization of um, the synth as well. You know, it looks amazing. It looks mm. great in a postcard, a poster, this kind of thing. Um, and we have to be wary of that as well, because, you know, as everyone else on this panel knows, actually making music on a Moog is much more difficult. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, it's interesting, they, when I interviewed them, they were really geeking out in intense detail about, you know, the process and, the nuts and bolts um, and um, you know there's the world around them that is interested in that too and you know I, I love the music of Stranger Things I think it kind of um, yeah, brings kind of the sort of hauntings of that music to a new generation to you know kids who are going to seek those things out you know the video game side of Wendy's um, output as well is interesting and I you know I'd love to know more about that that's something I don't know about but you know that's going to have a connection possibly with the younger generations too. Well, it's great to see that Carlos's music is still being is still influencing contemporary musicians. Will, do you think the development of electronic music would have been the same without Carlos's contributions? No, I don't think it would. I think we've already heard that um, <clears throat> Carlos and Moog had this collaboration. Um, and I think, you know, Moog was one of the few synthesizer designers who was listening uh, at that time to musicians, because I think a lot of the synthesizers that arrived on the scene at that point um, were fundamentally difficult to play. You couldn't, like Adrian said, you know, some of them didn't even have keyboards attached to them. Certainly with Stockhausen, it was just knobs, dials and tape. Um, and so I think that that playability, the performance side of a making a synthesizer, it, we have to give a huge, de you know, debt of thanks to Wendy. You know, from otherwise we wouldn't have had the mini moog. I don't think when we did. Um, and I think that switched on Bach started a conversation which hadn't been going on. I think before that, there was a niche idea of what electronic music was, but in the popular, you know, uh, cultural vision of, of electronic music, there was a void. I don't think it was a discussion. Um, and I think when that record came out, um, everybody suddenly realized what, you know, that, wow, we've got to this point where we can be this expressive and this exciting and this kind of detailed and this musical um, with an electronic piece of kit. And I think that that, that moment was a, yeah, it was a huge kind of, um, what's the word, you know, it was a, the whole a seismic shift in how everybody felt about um, electronic music and I think that also and maybe about Bach actually too because um, I think that it suddenly there was another layer of depth that you could see through um, that that gave everybody uh, you know that this kind of beautiful vision of what polyphony was um, I actually don't for me every other record that came out that was reproducing classical music electronically 
was less interesting. I don't think I really, I've never, I mean, you know, obviously people love to meet her and I think it's beautifully done, but it's the marriage for me of monophonic synthesizer and monof and polyphony that is the major, you know, attraction and the genius about that record. And I still think it's the best um, iteration of classical music uh, performed electronically to this day. Yeah, I think, I think the only album for me that 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 tops it is um, came. I think it was in '96. It was Kurt Duka's uh, switched on Wagner. And, oh really? Yeah, <laughs> and out. it was on the Mil Plateau label, uh, and he was a label mate of mine. And it and it, it plays into this monophonic aspect very beautifully. And and uh, so uh, other yeah, th that's the only other album I can think of in that oeuvre. Mm -hmm. that really yeah get, kind of excites me thanks for the tip i'm going to check that out kurt duka <laughs> yeah. duka d-u-c-a c-u-r-d-d-u-c-a well thank you all so much this has been such an enlightening conversation and i think we have proven the point that wendy carlos's music and sonic innovations and technological innovations change the course of help change the course of popular music in the 20th century and certainly change the course of electronic music. I want to thank our special guests, Will Gregory, Jude Rogers, Terry Tamlitz, and Adrian Utley, and of course, the staff at the British Library. And of course, we give much gratitude to Wendy Carlos and her pioneering work. I'm Colleen Cosmo Murphy, and I hope to see you all at one of our in-person events for the British Library's Season of Sound this spring. Thanks for listening. <laughs>